I am just about to upload this video and I realise that I should probably warn you that some of the content is pretty disgusting and gory. This is my first video in six months. In that time, I have moved to the other end of the country. So this is my first time filming in my new home, which is very exciting. So, um, cheers. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk to you about today is maybe my favorite topic to bring up at parties to like always kill the vibe. It's something that I massively geek out on. And I think that <laughs> because we as humans have this morbid curiosity with everything disgusting, something that I hope you guys will really enjoy to learn about. I'm going to talk to you today about what is known as the surgical revolution, two turning points in the 19th century that transformed modern medicine. These two turning points were the discovery and use of anesthesia in surgery and the practice of antiseptic surgery. So something that I think is pretty cool is that this video can be used as GCSE history revision. When I was in year 11, I studied medicine through time. I've checked it out and that is still one of the main modules that is taught for history students. So if you know anyone that is studying that, I like to think that if I was in year 11 watching me, I wouldn't think it was totally boring. Maybe? Okay, cool. So, um, hope you enjoy. Before these pioneering discoveries of anesthetic and antiseptic, surgery was so dangerous that it was considered a last resort. So if it was thought that the patient was going to die anyway, then there was nothing left to lose. But during a time before it was known how to prevent infection, people could die from minor injuries. And so surgery was considered worth the risk. To understand why surgery was considered such a last resort, I'm going to paint a little bit of a picture of what it would have looked like at this time. Spoiler, it was absolutely bloody disgusting. There's a reason that these were known and still are known as operating theatres. These surgeries were ticketed events and were attended by spectators as a form of entertainment. These theatres were often so crowded that surgeons would have to make people leave because because there was physically no room to perform the surgery. People would be pushing to get to the front to get the best view of the spectacle that was about to unfold. They're about to witness a patient being operated on without any anaesthetic. The patient would be fully awake, tied down or held down by assistance so they could not escape. These patients were so awake that there were records of them being able to count exactly the amount of sores it took for their limbs to be cut off. Because there was not yet an understanding of the danger of germs and the need to sanitize before surgery, instruments would go unwashed, surgeons would operate with their bare hands and the blood-stained apron, which I think is quite typical when you imagine like a bloody surgeon in Victorian times. The bloodier the apron, the better it looked because it showed that they were experienced and performed multiple surgeries. The floor was so covered in blood and guts that sawdust would be thrown to absorb some of the bodily fluids to make it a bit more pleasant for the people to be in. The smell that filled these theatres, this smell of rotting flesh, blood, guts, disease, it was known as the good old hospital stink. A particular surgeon that I'm going to talk to you about is a man named Robert Liston, who in 1846 performed the first surgery using ether as an anaesthetic in Europe. However, before this pioneering breakthrough, Liston had gotten quite a name for himself. In an age before anaesthesia, the endurance of pain could determine the life or death of a patient. This meant that surgeons had to operate as fast as they possibly could. Liston was known for his impressive speed and thus the high success rate of his operations, which for today's standards was still shockingly low. Robert Liston first became well known for removing a 45 pound tumour from a man's scrotum without anaesthetic in under four minutes. If you are terrible at understanding measurements of weight, like me, I looked it up and it says that 45 pounds is the equivalent to the weight of an average male bulldog. So this man had a bulldog hanging off his balls. It was cut off without anaesthetic in four minutes with loads of people watching as well. Now, Lister was kind of an entertainer as much as he was a surgeon. He would walk into the operating theater and bellow, time me gentlemen, wanting to always beat his own record of amputating limbs in front of a crowd of his fans. Known as the fastest knife in the West End, he was known to be able to hold you down with his left arm and amputate a limb in 30 seconds. There is one particular story of a patient laid on the table who suddenly changed his mind. Before being tied down, he runs and hides in the nearest closet. Liston is supposedly known to have chased after the patient, ripped the closet doors off its hinges and literally dragged the man back to be tied down and operated on. But his speed could also prove fatal. Once, Liston was working so quickly to amputate a patient's limb that he accidentally also took off 
three of his assistant's fingers. Not only that, but while switching blades, slashed a spectator's coat at the same time. Both the patient and the assistant died of post-operative infections, and the spectator is said to have died of shock on the spot. Dying of shock, I feel like, is something you always hear about in, in the olden days, and it doesn't really happen much now. What I imagine it to be is they died of a heart attack. I mean, it sounds like a pretty intense environment to be in, to be honest. So this surgery is known as the only surgery to have a 300% death rate. On the 21st of December, 1846, Robert Liston performs the first surgery using ether as an anaesthetic in Europe. It had been done before by a doctor in Georgia in the United States, but he had not recorded his findings. And by the time he did, a dentist from Boston had already risen to fame by extracting a tooth using ether. Word quickly spread to Europe, but people were very sceptical, including Liston himself. However, being the entertainer that he was, he was willing to give it a go. So the day comes, and the surgery is a success. Liston removes the patient's leg, a man named Frederick Churchill, in under 28 seconds. Ties up the arteries, at one point holding the thread in his mouth, and eventually stitches up the flesh. When Churchill awoke, he is supposedly known to have asked when the surgery was about to take place. The surgery was celebrated across the country, with newspapers posting headlines saying that man had conquered pain, and surgeons no longer had to work to the limit of pain that a body could endure. This meant that more invasive, more risky surgeries could be performed, that were deemed totally off limits to perform on a patient that would have been awake and feeling everything. Surgeons were going further into the body, developing new skills, performing new procedures, but this also had its downsides. Anesthetic made surgery. He was uh, drinking in the shower and turned the ventilator on. This is Aeneas though, if you haven't met him. So, as I was saying, these doctors... These doctors didn't understand the importance of having sterile conditions. Surgeons were becoming more brave, and so they were going deeper into the body with the same dirty apron, dirty hands, instruments in their mouths, and you can imagine that they were causing actually a lot more harm. After the discovery of anaesthetic, the death rate after surgery went up. The age of agony was over, but conquering pain was only the first step towards transforming surgery. Very few patients who went through surgery recovered without any kind of complication. Patients were pulling through operations, only to die later in hospitals of post-operative infections. And hospitals themselves were largely the cause. Also known at the time as houses of death, hospitals were the centres of disease. In fact, you were three to five times more likely to die from an operation that was performed in a hospital than you would be if the same operation was performed at home. This seems strange to us, but actually at the time, because of the dangers of being in hospital, if wealthy people could afford it, they would have private surgeons come to their home and operate on them on the kitchen table or whatever, whatever furniture they could find. Now, even though hospitals were reserved for the poor, they were reserved for what was known as the deserving poor. You still had to have a certain level of income to pay for your entry into a hospital. And this was actually partly due to the fact that the death rate in hospitals was so high that some charged their patients for their inevitable burial in advance. So why was infection so prevalent in hospitals? Well, maybe this story will explain it. In the early 1800s, a patient suffering with a compound fracture received visitors. The visitors noticed that in between his soiled and wet and mouldy bedsheets, there were maggots and mushrooms growing. The patient didn't want Stink to complain because this is just what hospitals were like. Bug infestations were so common in hospitals that the bug killer actually earned more money than the doctors did. This was only taking place 200 years ago. When you take into consideration that this was the surgical and medical norm for the time, I don't think 200 years is that long ago. I imagine 300 years ago, maybe more. The fact that this was still taking place until not that long ago shows that this transformation was relatively recent. I know it's really, really hard for us to comprehend how this could be allowed, but before a time of germ theory, it wasn't understood that these poor hygiene standards were leading to infection. Poor conditions of these hospitals were also due to the Industrial Revolution and the huge rise in population, which meant that cities, especially London, were horribly overcrowded. In the 19th century, London's population grew from 1 million to 6 million, and the city literally couldn't keep up with this. Cemeteries were overrun with corpses, and hospitals were incredibly overcrowded. Deaths in these hospitals... <laughs> The deaths in these hospitals were attributed to what was known as hospitalism, which was an umbrella term. <laughs> Just wanted to add in that I shouldn't have been smiling then, it was the cat, it was, no, it's not a funny subject, I'm sorry. Which was an umbrella term for the infections that were plaguing hospitals and killing patients. The infections that hospitalism included were known as the big four. Number one was septicemia, which is blood poisoning. Number two was gangrene. 
which were ulcers that formed on the body and led to a decay in flesh. And yes, this is not the time, okay? This is quite a disgusting and serious topic. Gangrene, which were ulcers that formed and rotted the flesh. Pyemia, which was the development of pus-filled abscesses, abscesses? abscesses across the body. And erysipelas, which caused high fevers and eventually death. One particular description of hospital gangrene, written by the surgeon John Bell, reads that sufferers are the same in the night as in the daytime. They are exhausted and in the course of a week die. Or, if they survive, the ulcers continue to eat down into and disjoin the muscles. The vessels are exposed, eroded, and they eventually bleed to death. So, it was known what these infections were, but the issue was that nobody knew what was causing them. But that was all about to change. Present at that famous 1846 surgery performed by Liston, was a young man, an aspiring medical student. He witnessed the success of the surgery. He shook hands with men in the profession, congratulated them and celebrated the amazing breakthrough. But he knew something wasn't right. He just didn't know what yet. So make sure to watch my next episode where we learn about this man, Joseph Lister, the father of modern surgery.